Hello, Vibe Tribe. Welcome back to, well, my kitchen. Um, today we are having another wellness workshop, and I want to welcome you all to um, a really fun kind of afternoon of cooking. Um, this month, as you may have seen, our wellness theme is that of power and play. So I want to talk a little bit about how power and play come into play when we're cooking and when we're baking and when we're creating things. Because creativity is really um, a combination of power and play. And I want to bring that all um, into what we're going to be doing today. So I didn't post a recipe um, for what we're doing. And interestingly enough, for what we're making today, I don't even actually usually use a recipe. I'm following one today so that I can share it with you so that we can experiment. But um, for real, what we can do is experiment and learn and play together. And that's really what this is all about. So if I didn't say it, my name is Shelly. I am with Five Vault Fit. And today we are talking about cooking, baking, wellness, power, and play. So let's get right started. Today, what I'm going to make for you or what we're gonna make together is apple crisp. And I did a little bit of the prep work beforehand because it's really not too fun to watch me peel and chop apples too much. But I wanna talk a little bit about apples, what they mean for us, what they can do for our bodies, and also how we can use them in all kinds of different ways. We had gone back and forth about what we were gonna make for this workshop. And I chose this for two reasons. First of all, there's no better time than the fall to use apples. They're fresh, they're in season, and that's really the best time to use any produce is when they're in season. And also because I really needed an excuse to bring my kids apple picking. I really wanted to go apple picking and I really wanted to uh, <laughs> have a reason to share that with everyone. So as I said, I've done a little bit of the prep work. I have peeled and cut a whole bunch of apples, but I still need to do a little bit more. So we're gonna work together. The first thing I wanna talk to you about is these apples merely because tie it in a little bit, right? A lot of the other ingredients that we're gonna be using are things we talked about last month when we were talking about granola. Um, but the apples themselves are really just a super delicious food to use for us. Um, you've probably all heard the old time saying an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And that is actually based on some really old information um, and some old um sayings going back to a Welsh verse from the 1830s. And it's actually pretty darn accurate, to be honest. Um, it has a long history going back to biblical, or apples have a long history going back to biblical times of being special, of being nutritious, of having magical powers, going back to the, the Garden of Eden. Um, apples used to be indigenous to Asia and Europe and were brought over to North America around the mid 17th century. But the only apples that are truly indigenous to North America are crab apples. And we're not going to be using those. They don't taste so good. We're going to be using a variety of other apples for what we're doing today. But, uh, apples are actually the second most consumed food in the United States, second only to bananas. And they have thousands of varietals available depending on where you live, um, depending on what's in season. Some grow better in cooler weather, some grow better in warmer weather. And um, so what we're going to be using today is a variety of crisp and slightly sweet, slightly tart apples. Um, what I picked was a lot of Johnna Gold apples and some um, honey crisp apples and some Mutsu apples. I Those are kind of my favorites. I like a bite. I like a little bit of tart. So um, as far as the health benefits of apples, believe it or not, a lot of the nutrients in the apples can be found in the peels. So I don't know if you notice, as I'm peeling the apples, I'm saving them. I'm saving the peels and cores. And I'm going to show you what we're going to try and do with them in just a little bit. That being said, when you eat an apple, especially when you're eating it raw, it's really great to eat the whole thing. Believe it or not, I freaked my kids out the first time I did this. This is the core of the apple, it contains the seeds. I know there's a lot of urban legends going around about how poisonous and deadly the apple seeds are. And if you've watched the movie, The Blob, where it's all about apple orchards and how bad apple seeds can be for you. In small doses, the amount of seeds, the amount of you know, toxins in this one apple's worth of apple seeds is so negligible, you would need to eat pretty much an orchard full of apples in order to see any sort of problem. But I freaked my kids out the first time I ever actually showed them that you can eat an entire apple, seeds and all. Um, 
but a lot of the nutrients in the apple can be found in the peels. Apples contain a good amount of fiber, which is actually really good for our bodies. Um, they have a whole bunch of antioxidants and have been shown to, um, to contribute to a reduction in certain cancers, in certain cardiovascular diseases. Some of those antioxidants can actually help our breathing and can help with asthma and can even help regulate blood sugar. So we're good for um, diabetes. Again, talk with your doctor, not offering medical advice, but I want you to know these, this fruit, something that can be found so abundantly in most areas of where we are, has significant health benefits. Um, the antioxidant power of one apple is equal to that of 1500 milligrams of vitamin C, but there's also a significant amount of vitamin A, vitamin B1, vitamin B2, and vitamin B6, as well as a whole bunch of other minerals that have been shown to contain antioxidants and anti-inflammatories. So it really contains a pretty powerful punch for one little piece of fruit. The different varieties are really caused by um, the different nutrient com uh, the nutrient content of each different kind of apple. And it contributes to the difference in size, in shape, in color, in flavor, in texture of each of the apples. Really, it's up to you what you like best. Everyone has a preference as to what variety they like best. So really, it's kind of a fun game to play to go apple tasting and see what you like. Everyone has a different preference. And that's kind of a cool thing about it. Um, the, um, they are also a good source of dietary fiber, fiber including pectin, which can um, serve as a prebiotic, which is really good for your gut health. So overall, there's a lot of good things to be found in apples. How are we going to use these apples today? Today, as I said, my main recipe that I want to show you is to make apple crisp. And as I said, when I started, I don't actually usually follow a recipe when I'm making apple crisp. And that's because as long as you have the basic components down, there's really a lot of um, wiggle room for making it exactly how you want it. So what I've done is I've cut, I think there's about six apples in here. And we'll use it however much we wind up needing. I'm baking it in this eight by eight cooking pan or baking pan. And what we're gonna do is we need to coat these apples to make them extra gooey delicious if they bake nice and well. And then we need a streusel topping. That's kind of what makes it an apple crisp. Historically, in the United States, there's not a lot of difference between an apple crisp and an apple crumble, depending on where you are geographically. Sometimes people have a very significant difference between what those mean. I'm making what is generally referred to as an apple crisp. So what we have for our streusel topping, it's based in oats. That's the main component of it. The one thing I will say about these apples is that the most important thing you want to do is you want to cut all your apples into approximately equal size pieces so that they'll bake evenly. If you have some large chunks, some smaller chunks, you're going to find them baking unevenly. And that sometimes is unpleasant for some people because it gives you a different mouthfeel. Some will cook a lot faster and will be mushier and some will cook a lot slower and will still feel a little bit raw. So the main goal you have with your apples is to cut them into equal size chunks. Before we make our streusel topping, I want to prepare the apples to go into the pan. So we need a few things. The first thing I have is some coconut oil that I have melted. I am purposely making this apple crisp dairy-free and gluten-free because of the people that I'd like to share it with later on. Um, you can customize it to your preferences. Some people don't like the flavor that coconut oil adds to it. Use butter, use margarine, use a vegan butter su um, substitute, whatever works for you. I actually really like coconut oil. I like the flavor that it gives. So that's what I'm going to use. So I'm going to add a couple tablespoons of melted coconut oil to my apples. And I'm also going to add a couple of tablespoons of pure maple syrup. This recipe that I'm doing, I don't like a whole lot of um, sugars in it. Um, the apples themselves are super sweet. And they also, um, I find if you add too much sugar, it makes it a little bit cloying. So I tend to go with more natural sweetener and not too much of it. And the other thing we need to add, because we don't want our apple crisp to be too, um, too runny, is we have a little bit of flour. Some people use, I have it, it's a gluten-free flour mix. Some people use cornstarch. I have corn sensitivity, so not using cornstarch. Um, some people use regular flour. You can pretty much use any flour you want in this whole recipe. The only flour that I recommend you not use is coconut. 
flour. Because coconut flour, despite the fact that I said coconut oil, I love the flavor. Coconut flour affects the texture. It actually pulls out more moisture than any of the other flours that we're using. So I don't recommend using coconut flour for this. So this is a combination, I'm not sure we can see here. This is a combination of um, gluten-free flour, cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, and clove. Basically the basic ingredients of apple pie spice. I'm gonna take a little fork and I'm gonna mix that up together. And then I'm going to sprinkle that onto my apples. What this does is that gives the apples a little bit of flavor within the apple crisp and the flour or the gluten-free flour, whatever flour you decide you're gonna use, the flour will help bind it together and make it more syrupy rather than juicy when we um, bake the apple crisp and when it's all completed. So just giving this a little bit of a gentle toss. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this into our pan, however much fits. And that's really, you, know, you never know, it's not an exact science with exactly how many apples you need. Because every apple, especially when I pick them myself, they're slightly different size, slightly different, you know, it's all good. So what I wanna do is I wanna mostly fill my baking pan. Okay, there's a few left over, but guess what? We're gonna be able to use those just a little bit and I'll show you. Because apples are extremely versatile and you can make pretty much anything out of them. I don't know about you, but I love to eat apples pretty much every day as a snack. I find them to be tasty and pretty good. All right, so the next thing that we're going to need is to create our crumble topping, our streusel topping. So for our streusel topping, we need our oats, which are right here. We need some more flour. And then right back here. I didn't measure this one out. I'm putting a little bit more coconut oil, but for this one, I didn't melt it first. And the reason why I didn't melt it is because I want to create um, something that's going to hold together a little bit well that's not too wet. Again, another couple of tablespoons is all you really need. And a few more spices. Again, this is the part I do not measure. I'm sorry. <laughs> I realize that's not um, as helpful as far as recreating exactly. So I'm using some cinnamon, some ginger, And I think I'm gonna add a little bit more maple syrup. So that way we have some consistency in the flavor profile. And this is where we have some of our fun. I pinch this together with my fingers. In a way it's similar to making a pastry topping. I mean, it is a pastry topping, but it's similar, it's similar to making a pastry dough in that you don't wanna overwork it, but you also wanna be able to control the texture that you're going for. The coconut oil that we use, similar to any butter, it will melt and it will help hold it together. And the moisture that's in the apples themselves, that is going to um, help to create a cohesive texture for our topping. So once we have that pretty mixed together, we're going to crumble it right on top of our apple crisp, of our apples. I don't like to break it apart too much when I'm putting it on because I actually really like it when it gets crisp and clumpy. It's funny to say clumpy is a good thing, but it really is when we're talking about an apple crisp. And the fun thing about a recipe like this is you can actually use any seasonal fruit. So over the summer, you can do it with peaches or plums. You can do it with tropical fruits. You can do anything that you want. And that's part of the joy of cooking and baking. So in one second, we're gonna get this into the oven. I've preheated the oven to 350 degrees. Let's use a spatula to get the rest of this off. As I mentioned last time, I wash my hands about 800 times when I'm baking and I'm gonna to have to do it again in just a second. Um, so let's get this all in here and let's get this in the oven. There we go. This is set. And Get this guy in the oven. 
Alrighty, that's gonna take quite a while to bake. So I don't think you guys are gonna see the finished product here. I will post it on our Vibe Tribe members page. So hopefully you guys will follow along and see it there. So while that is doing its thing, I not only wanna talk about some other things you can do with apples, but I wanna talk about how what we're doing today ties in with our theme. I know a lot of people are afraid of cooking or afraid of baking. They say they're really bad at it or, you know, they're intimidated by the variety of recipes that are out there. And I want to talk about how we can kind of overcome that a little bit. Cooking and baking are essential life skills in a lot of ways. Everyone has to eat. Everyone needs nourishment. And being able to feed both yourself and the people you love is actually a really special skill, a really special trait. And it's something that can really... Um, enrich your life and the lives of the people around you. So learning the basics of how to cook, becoming comfortable in your own kitchen, in your own space, it's a big part of life and it's something that can be very fulfilling and very self-affirming. You can use your cooking and your baking to communicate, which is largely what I do. Um, and you can also use your cooking and baking to help care for the people around you and the people that you love. The ability to nourish another living being brings personal fulfillment and it also brings joy to those around you. And those are actually very empowering feelings and empowering thoughts. So the act, the simple act of cooking, the simple act of putting a few ingredients together can be a very empowering thing. It can be something that really um, enriches your life and the lives of the people around you. I did a little bit of research about when, empowerment and cooking because it, when I first started pulling this together, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes out there about, you know, women in the kitchen and it being a, you know, a demeaning or a gender role type situation, but that's really not true. That's really actually a relatively recent phenomenon. That's something that really only came to um, be the lore or the, the way people thought about it after um, when people, when, when farming went out of style, really, when farming was the main source of um, income and the way families really worked together, families worked together. There was no um, men belong in the field, women belong in the kitchen. There, there, that wasn't the case. When men and women really shared household responsibilities and work responsibilities pretty evenly, it was only when um, we moved away from an agricultural society and into more of a business society that it became a little bit more um, gendered in that sort of way. So women's empowerment as defined by Wikipedia is the process in which women elaborate and recreate what it is that they can be, can do, and can accomplish in circumstances that they were previously denied. And I kind of want to expand on this definition just a little bit because I want to expand on that word denied. I don't want it to just be denied. I want to broaden that to include the circumstances in which um, women were not previously knowledgeable or allowed to become knowledgeable or successful or allowed to become successful. Circumstances in which women were denied of their choice and denied of, their, of encouragement in the world or in society or in their own families. We were denied, women were denied, people are sometimes denied because sometimes it's flipping back and forth. Um, empowerment within the kitchen. We were relegated to the kitchen. It was seen as this is just where you belong. Everyone's probably already heard the term barefoot and pregnant and seen as like a, a diminished role within the household. I don't think that's true. And I don't agree with using it as a way of denying someone's power. And I want to take that power back. And I think that cooking and baking and communicating through food is a really strong way of doing that. Learning a new skill, a new craft, a new trade is extremely empowering. Taking over the role in the kitchen, taking over what you can do and what you can provide to your family is extremely empowering. Bringing joy to other people is extremely empowering. Sharing your own creations, bringing something that you have done with your own hands and your own heart is extremely empowering. And I feel like using our kitchen skills or improving our kitchen skills or even beginning to develop our kitchen skills can actually be used in this way and can be seen in this way. Food is integral to life. Providing food is a very powerful act. And providing food that people can enjoy as opposed to the bare minimum of sustenance, 
that's a beautiful thing. And it's something that I hope we can all latch onto and that we can all grow with and that we can all experience in our own lives. Increasing your skills in the kitchen and increasing your repertoire of um, recipes. That's great. That's beautiful. That's fantastic. So hopefully you guys all um, can learn a little bit from this about um, just gaining your confidence in the kitchen because that's really what it's all about. That's really what we're here for. I know we're talking about the nutritional aspect of it and I know we're talking about how powerful these ingredients are and they really are. But really what it's about is your, um, your confidence in the kitchen and your ability to, um, to really assert your confidence and to feel powerful in what you are able to create and what you're able to provide for yourself, for your family, for those you love. Um, additionally, as far as empowerment in the kitchen and empowerment with cooking, the actual act of cooking and of preparing foods requires a lot of skills that are not usually talked about. It requires a lot of planning and it requires a lot of executive functioning skills. They say that people who hone their skills in the kitchen and who hone these executive functioning skills have increased confidence and that um, they're actually better able to manage their anger and regulate their emotions. And I think that's pretty cool. Just coming from, well, I think I'll throw an apple crisp in the oven to, wow, it's helping me regulate my emotions. I think there's a strong connection there. And I actually think that's really interesting. Um, there's also an aspect uh, in the research that I found really, really interesting about other ways that cooking and food preparation has been used to, um, to empower people. And there's a lot of places around the world in which um, people have been, you know, indigenous people or um, impoverished people have been beat down and denied a lot of opportunities. And people have created programs that go in and teach children in these areas basic cooking skills and then give them workshops as far as how to learn how to cook and how to bake. And they've taught them these skills these vocational skills and these programs are extremely successful with getting these kids jobs in restaurants, in kitchens, and lifting up these families and these communities. It's something that you don't really think about, but it's a way of using cooking, using food to empower lives, empower communities, empower the world. So again, when we think about cooking, you don't, your first thought probably isn't empowerment, but there's a, such a strong connection and I really hope to maybe bring a little bit of that to you. I also want to talk about the other aspect of our um, monthly theme, which is play. We're talking about power and play. So we've already talked a little bit about how food can make you feel more powerful, how preparing food is a very empowering act. But I also want it to be fun. As I said, I know so many people who say to me, I don't know how you do it. It's so scary. I'm scared of the kitchen. I'm scared to bake. Everything I make you know, fails. Unfortunately, what that is, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I want you to throw that mindset completely out the window. Cooking is intended to be fun. Food is not just for nourishment anymore. Food is fun and food is a way of playing. And that's what we're doing here today. We are playing with our food in the best way possible. Learning about food and learning about different ways of manipulating food it's a game. It's fun. It's different textures. It's different flavors. It's experimenting. It's trying new things. It's gaining your confidence that way. It's learning what you like and what you don't like. It's a uh, community. It's, it's communal and something that you can do together with your family. So I wanted to talk about a few ways that we can bring a little bit more fun into cooking. While we do that, I want to prepare one more thing, merely because we can. Um, as I said, there's plenty of other things that we can do with apples. And this one, while I talk, I'm going to show you something really easy, easy apple dumplings that you can make with canned um, crescent roll dough, or you can make your own pastry. But I want to show you something else fun we can do while we talk about ways to make it fun. I always have a little bit of trouble. Yeah, there we go. That's open now. We're going to need one more apple for this, and I'll show you. Anyway, so ways we can make cooking and baking a little bit more fun, especially if it's something that makes you nervous. All these apples, by the way, I want to share, have been um, scrubbed clean because I want to show you what we're going to do with the peels. So they were scrubbed clean and dried. So, And I picked them at a local orchard that doesn't use um, chemical pesticides. But use what you've got and use what you like. So how can we make cooking more fun? We can make cooking more fun by changing our mindset, by taking the fear out of it, by saying, what's the worst that happens? 
The worst that happens is it doesn't turn out and you try something else next time. We can also try new things, experiment, make one day of the week your day to try something new. Make one day of the week or one, you know, some time frame that works for you. Make that your time to learn about another culture through foods or to let your kids take control of the menu and see what happens. Um, or to choose something random, do recipe roulette, whatever works for you. Another way to make cooking more fun, and this is my favorite way, is to put music on in the kitchen. I can't even tell you the number of dance parties we have in this kitchen pretty much every day. Um, we do a lot of dancing, a lot of silliness in our kitchen, and it keeps everyone entertained, and it keeps everyone being a part of the process. And that brings me to the next one. Make cooking and baking a family affair. Bring everyone into it. Doesn't matter. Yes, the kitchen will be a mess. Yes, you'll have a bit of cleanup to do. Make that a part of the family affair as well. But it brings everyone together, and it makes it a shared activity that you guys will be able to um, grow together and learn together and bring your friends into it as well. And the other way to make it more fun, just need to get a baking sheet. It's to set yourself up for success. Having this baking sheet out first would have been a really good example of that. It's to set yourself up for success. You can't see over here, but I have all my ingredients lined up. I pre-measured things. I made sure that I had everything I needed from the grocery store before I started. Set yourself up for success because there's nothing more frustrating than beginning a recipe and then realizing that you don't have what you need or that you're missing a key ingredient. That will set yourself up to not enjoy the process at all. And it's going to make it really frustrating. And then you're going to find that convenience foods or convenience, uh, convenience um, prepackaged items are going to just feel better because it's all done and you don't have to stress about what you have and what you don't have. So a little bit of pre-planning, those executive functioning skills that I mentioned before, a little bit of pre-planning goes a really long way for how much you're going to enjoy your cooking and baking. And that's kind of why I enjoy doing this because I'm bringing you guys into my kitchen and we're baking together a little bit of pre-planning and then having some fun people to cook and bake with makes it all the, all the more fun. So what I have in this bowl is some brown sugar and some of the same spices that I used for everything. It's the basic ingredients of apple pie spice. Some brown sugar and some spices. I'm taking these crescent rolls, these crescent dough, I'm spreading some of this cinnamon sugar mixture on it and taking one slice of apple and then roll it up. These are easy apple pie roll-ups or easy apple dumplings, however you want to phrase it. It's hard to roll with one hand though. Alrighty, so these are gonna go in the oven right with the apple crisp that we have. It's super easy. These only need about 15 minutes to bake. So these are something that you can make for your kids for an after-school snack. These are something that you can do super easily and with very little prep work and Believe it or not, very little cleanup work too, because it's really it's very straightforward. Now, while I finish rolling these, I wanna talk to you about some of the other things that you can very easily do with apples. And this is the first thing that I always do when I go apple picking. That very night, whenever I go apple picking, and I did this just the other day when I went apple picking, is I make applesauce. Applesauce is so easy to make. I make it in my crock pot, but you can make it right on your stove top if, that's, if you don't have a crock pot or if you don't like to use your crock pot. All I do is I peel and chop however many apples fit in my crock pot. I have a pretty big crock pot, so I can usually do about 10 apples, which is a decent amount of applesauce. I peel and cut them, and then I add whatever spices and a little bit of sweetener that I want. I usually wind up adding cinnamon, maple syrup as always, a little bit of brown sugar, and I love ginger, so I'll always add a little bit of ginger. And that's it. Put it in your crock pot, set it on low, and leave it overnight. When you wake up in the morning, your kitchen will smell divine, and your applesauce will be prepared. What I like to do at that point in the morning is I open up the crock pot and I put it onto high instead of low, which is where it's been cooking all night. And I let it sit for approximately another hour. The reason I do this is it thickens up the applesauce just a little bit. It lets some of that moisture cook out and evaporate. And doing that, I like the texture a little better. If you let that go for even a little longer, it turns your applesauce from applesauce into apple butter. 
I also then just take a spatula, a regular old spatula, and I mash the, um, the cooked apples. Some, I used to use an immersion blender or, or a potato masher, but I, don't, I found I didn't even need to do that. Using just even a silicone spatula like I was using to mix the um, streusel topping, those apples have cooked so much overnight that you don't need any more pressure than that. So making applesauce is super easy, super straightforward. Now, I don't know if you can see, I have these all rolled up. They don't have to be beautiful. They just have to be rolled. I'm actually gonna add them into the oven in a little while, try and time it so that, um, so that they'll finish around the same time as my apple crisp. Now, I have one more thing I wanted to talk to you about, and this one's a little bit more experimental for me. This goes in with the playing with your food kind of idea. There's something that we can do with these peels and cores, and that is make our own apple cider vinegar. I've tried this once before, and I'm not gonna lie, I did it wrong. <laughs> I did it wrong, and it didn't work. But I was really excited to try it again with you guys, because guess what? It, this is something that we would just throw away otherwise. This is something that no one even considers, but we could possibly get more benefit right from the same apples that we're using. So what I have here is a wide mouth canning jar. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna load in the apples, the cores and the peels that I've saved from the apples that I've used to make our delicious desserts. And we don't wanna fill this more than three quarters of the way up. So if I wind up filling this jar later, I'll try and use another one as well. And the reason we don't wanna fill it too much is we wanna give space to add our liquid and also for the fermentation process because that's what apple cider vinegar is. It's ferment. It's it's a process of fermentation and that's where it gets most of its health benefits as well. Um, fermenting things gives them prebiotic properties and it's really good for our gut health. That's a little big. We're gonna go back to some peels. Okay, and what we add to this, once we have those in there, is two cups of water and it has to be um, boiled and then cooled. And then we also need two tablespoons of sugar. So I have my tablespoon measure. I'm gonna mix that in with my two cups of water that has been boiled and then cooled down. Add a little stir. Now here's the thing, when you think of apple cider vinegar, you don't necessarily think of sugar. This sugar actually gives all that good bacteria something to eat. It's necessary for the process of the fermentation. If you don't feed that bacteria, obviously it won't grow. And these are healthy bacteria that we're talking about. We're not talking about anything that's gonna be harmful. So what we wanna do is we wanna put this in here and our goal is to cover all of the apple peels and cores. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this spatula and push this down. There we go, nice and covered. So what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna take, um, you want something a little bit porous, like a cheesecloth or a paper towel, and you wanna cover this, and then just put a rubber band around it to hold that cover onto it. And then you wanna store this in a uh, warm, dark place for two weeks. Sounds scary, it's a science experiment. Um, for two weeks. You can check on it every once in a while, but it really doesn't need too much work. And once you um, let it sit, you'll notice a little bit of fizzing, a little bit of bubbling going on. The reason you want it all submerged though is anything that's outside of the water could potentially grow mold. And you don't want that in your apple cider vinegar, but this is actually called apple scrap vinegar as opposed to apple cider vinegar, but it has many of the same health properties. Apple cider vinegar is actually extremely healthy. I don't know how many of you use, I use apple cider vinegar every single day. I drink it in a tea every single day. I enjoy the taste of it actually, but it's also extremely healthy. It's really good for you with those prebiotic properties. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover this and we're going to put it in a, a warm, dark place. If you don't have somewhere good in your kitchen, you can put it right on top of your refrigerator. Your refrigerator generates just enough heat that it won't cook anything. It's not hot, but it does keep it nice and warm to keep that bacteria growing and healthy in the ways that we want. So just like I'm going to share the results of that apple crisp with you uh, on the page in two weeks, keep an eye on that Vibe Tribe member page. And I'll let you know what happens with this apple cider vinegar. I got to this point before, left it in my warm, dark place, and I hadn't had it submerged well enough. So that's what happened. So we're trying it again. And thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to do that. Um, at this point, 
everything just needs to work. Everything just needs to do its magic. <laughs> the apple crisp is actually starting to smell really delicious. And we have everything we need in order to make anything else we want. Apples are delicious as a snack any time of day. Um, you can incorporate them into anything that you're eating. I like to dice them up and put them in my salads. I like to shred them up and include them when I make um, coleslaw or braised cabbage. So delicious, so versatile. You can really enjoy them all year long, all season long. Most of the orchards nearby pick them fresh, put them in refrigerated rooms, and you can get fresh local apples all year long. So something delicious, something I was really excited to share with you guys. I hope you guys feel confident to go into your kitchens and play around and make something absolutely delicious. Please, please share on our Facebook page, on our Instagram page, tag us in anything you make. I would love, love, love to see anything that you do, anything that you make, anything that you cook, any um, notes of empowerment that you feel when you go into the kitchen and really just let yourself free. I'd love to hear all about it. I'd love to hear all the stories. So thank you guys so much for joining me on this fun apple journey. I can't wait to show you pictures of my completed apple roll-ups and my completed apple crisp and to hopefully share a success story with this homemade apple cider vinegar. I hope you guys have a wonderful afternoon and thank you so much for tuning in. Bye guys.